Well, this is um, a great pleasure, and I'm very grateful to the organizers. It's also a pleasure because I believe this is a group that can't fire me, unlike my board. <laughs> Um, so I want to address some of the issues um, of this session through the lens of Diagnostics for All, which I will tend to call DFA. And we take the point of view that uh, the developing world isn't just a challenge or a terrible situation where things can't be addressed, but that if you could make a device that fits within all of the constrictions required for the developing world, like infinite scalability, minimal price, ease of use, ease of portability, and ease of disposal, then you'd likely have a product that would be dynamite f uh, across the world and would very likely revolutionize healthcare as we know it. So we argue that to be able to manage the health of a person or a population, you need to know what you're dealing with. So our exercise is really one of accurate intelligence, accurate information gathering. And in order to be successful in the developing world, and I've tried many times, um, I think you have to have two things. First, the right product. Secondly, the right business model. And by the right product, I mean something that is intrinsically low cost of goods. I'm not a believer in guaranteed prices. I think that stifles innovation. So something that's intrinsically affordable. And by the right business model, I mean something that is sustainable, that won't uh, die out when the grant runs out. So uh, let's look at the challenge. You know this well. In developed countries such as ours, we have large central hospitals, large central labs, very well-trained staff, usually reliable power and refrigeration. I live in Newton, and we didn't have it this year. Um, and usually uh, easy follow-up. In developing countries, we have a much more decentralized system with rural villages visited by community health workers where they have to carry everything with them, probably on a bicycle or on foot. And follow-up is really impossible. If a mother has walked four days through the bush, you cannot ask her to come back next week or the week after. So what we've decided was not to try and minimize or make more shoddy or more cheap things that we use at the Mass General here, but instead to take the problem and invent the simplest possible solution, and by that I also mean the cheapest. Now, if you look at what is the cheapest and most ubiquitous commodity around, it's comic books. It's colored printed paper. So we have started with the intrinsic wicking properties of paper. If you spill your coffee or your wine on your newspaper, it spreads out. So that's the principle. If you watch on the left, uh, a body fluid such as blood, urine, saliva, sweat, tears, will run along a microfluidic channel that we have pre-printed on the paper into reservoirs where uh, reactants, antibodies, whatever, are waiting and we get an instantaneous color reaction without using any power, no batteries, no clean water, no physician, not even skilled staff. And you see on the right that if you have an Illustrator program on your computer, you can make our device. Now, when I say you've got to have something that's intrinsically low cost of goods, we were really aiming for something that had no cost. But it's very difficult to make something that has truly zero cost, but we've come close. Uh, we take paper and we print it. We can print sheets just the way you print letters. And our device, which looks like this, uh, costs one three hundredth of a cent to make. And we can make 70 million a year. Nobody wants to sit at a printer for a year, but you actually could do it. If you look at the bottom line here, on the left you see you design a pattern, then you print it. What we use is a solid wax printer, which is commercially available. Um, then, because that prints a pattern just on the surface, it's a, it's a standard printer, you could all buy it. 
um, that makes the pattern, but in order to make the channels, hydrophobic channels in the hydrophilic paper, we heat it so that the wax goes all the way through and you have a watertight uh, set of microfluidic channels. It looks like a postage stamp. We print them in sheets like postage stamps. And if you want more millions or billions, you can fairly easily transition to roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing. Now, what I'm holding up may not be visible at the back of the room, but they truly are postage stamp sized. And if I were allowed to, I would be happy to prick your fingers and show you how it works. Now, in addition to the fairly simple devices, uh, we can also make more complicated ones simply by stacking layers of paper. And th this one is actually multi-layered. So if you look um, there, you can see Four different colored inputs will give you a very nice array of outputs. If you look at what is, in fact, our logo, this pattern, it's like those children's games where the little ball runs through different channels. You can make complex reactions where things interact, they interact in a timed way, or they don't interact. And you can leave reactants that you don't want to mix on the different layers of the paper. So you'll see on the far right that with um, a number of inputs, you can come out with an array or pattern that will give you an estimate, for example, of health risk if you wanted to be a life insurance uh, risk assessor. And it looks almost like a barcode. Now, our lead application is a liver function test. It was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. And rather than people say to us, well, why didn't you go in and test for AIDS or TB? We do not have a counseling arm yet at DFA, and we didn't want people to know we didn't want to be the group that initially came in and told people they have a very serious incurable disease. This is designed for people who already know that they have HIV or t TB, are already on drugs, but those drugs may damage their liver. So this gives us a very easy response to the test, which is you can take them off those drugs and put them on newer ones. Very often the ones that are given out for free are not the latest drugs. So in the US, the incidence of liver damage on AIDS and TB drugs is 2%. In the developing world, it's 25%, and the difference is the lack of, of testing. So it works very simply. Um, in this case, this is a blood test. We have urine, saliva, everything else tests. You prick your finger. You put the drop of blood on the back of the device. It wicks into the paper. And within uh, 15 minutes, in this case, we have many tests that run three or five minutes, you get a color reaction, which you can match to the color guide. So in its simplest form, you have an instantaneous color readout that is semi-quantitative. Now, I'm also going to show you how you get to a quantitative result using a scanner or a cell phone. Um, we have done a very large amount of clinical testing because the first question that comes up is, is it as sensitive? Is it as reproducible as what is used? We have done comparative studies here at the Beth Israel Hospital, and rather than going through all of the numbers, I think you can see that the accuracy runs close to 100%. It's less in that ALT blood, 89%, which isn't bad, and that is because in this case we were using stored blood, and you get a little bit of lysis of red cells. Now, a color reaction based on chemistry is interesting, but you also know that there are many devices that run on immunology, the uh, matching of an antibody to an antigen. This too we can do simply with layers of paper. We put an antigen in a sample, uh, often urine, onto the top of the paper. There it interacts with blue particles that we put onto the next layer of paper. And we have made it such that they dwell there for a while, so there's very good interaction. Then that complex binds to a capture layer, and we wash away unreacted um, particles. This is very similar to the way you do ELISAs and immunoassays in any lab. We peel off the back, and you have a test. We have initially um, used this as a demonstration. This is a urine pregnancy test. And it seems to me that if you can't tell if you're pregnant on that, 
um, you've got other problems. It's like that beer. If you can see that it's gone blue and it's cold, it's ready to drink. Now, of course, pregnancy, nobody's yet discovered how to be a little bit pregnant. So it's yes or no. And very often, you want something more complicated. You may have a mother with a sick child with a fever. And it doesn't really help her to know with exquisite accuracy, not malaria. She wants to know what the child has. So we have decided to go into something called multiplexing, which is putting several tests on one of these postage-sized bits of paper. What we have done here is there's a control in the middle, but you could test for flu A, flu B, dengue, malaria, or brucella. Of course, you could pick uh, another uh, set of possible infectious diseases or another set of metabolic markers that you might want. And again, your readout can be in squares, in patterns, in columns, whatever is easy for the healthcare worker to ascertain. Now, since this is all done with printing and it's printed intelligence, in addition to the wax printing, and you can use gravure printing, inkjet printing, silkscreen printing, many methods, we can print with carbon black or silver, silver chloride so that we can uh, do electrochemical detection. This, as many of you may know, is very useful if you want to test for glucose of the type that would go into a glucometer that you see at the bottom there. And I have with me a test actually like the one that would fit in a glucometer. You could also test for heavy metals in water like lead or arsenic. But in particular, we wanted to get away from the glucometer, again, away from any handheld device with cost in it and get all of the readout back on the piece of paper. And so uh, we have a very exciting program to put flexible electronics, again, onto something the size of a postage stamp. We're doing this with another company in town, again with Gates Money. You can see that thing that looks like a Salvador Dali picture. That is one of our devices draped to show that these things are truly flexible. So we can get um, transmittance or reflectance quantitatively using flexible LEDs and photodiodes and uh, ribbon batteries. And uh, so we can get readerless quantitative detection and a lot of uh, sensitivity. This is still in development. This test is, is not ready for me to show off to you. Now, I think it's a mistake to think of human health as completely separate from environmental health and animal health. I think they all relate, and I'm pleased that Bill Gates feels the same and that one of the better ways to combat poverty and hunger is to help the smallholder farmers. So we um, have been very pleased to get a grant from them to develop tests for pregnancy and heat in cows and cattle, for milk spoilage and for aflatoxin in grain. Now, I said at the beginning that we get a very nice quantitative readout just by color that's easy, it's cheap, and uh, can, can be the basis for a clinical decision. But since everybody in the developing world has camera phones, including the very weird guy in the top right there, um, you can realize that what you can do is photograph one of our devices after you've got your test. You can show it off on Facebook. You can send it to a friend. You can send it to a robot computer, a physician, a nearby hospital. But importantly, you get a quantitative patient record with a GPS stamp and a date stamp. And I think this allows you to do more than just get uh, a permanent patient record. You can now begin to do global tracking of health and disease. I think this will be extremely important for world health and for military uses. We can determine hot spots of disease. And as we're successful, as we are in biopharma, as we come up with new vaccines, new drugs, new treatments, we can begin to watch the character and spread of a disease change. We can look at emergence, re-emergence of new strains, track pandemics, and perhaps even identify hot spit spots of counterfeit drugs. So I want to finish up by telling you about the business model very briefly. We have several sources of funding, grants, donations, and license deals. You can see the uh, opportunities where our technology would be particularly useful. 
This is my last slide, and I think it's an important one. I have been in the industry a long time. I've always wanted to get technology to everybody who needs it, including in the developing world. I've tried many models. What we're doing here is DFA is a nonprofit. It's a 501c3. Its mission is clear to bring things affordably to the developing world using local partners, and we want to make sure about affordable. They, those local partners can make a profit, but not much. And what we have for our partnerships with the developed world is a wholly owned subsidiary, Paper Diagnostics, which is for profit, which acts like any uh, biotech company and does licensing deals with upfronts, milestones, and royalties. It's royalties that will sustain us through the years. We will, of course, pay taxes on those profits and we will pay Harvard, which is just about as punishing. And um, everything else will inure back to the benefit of our pure mission, uh, which is to bring diagnostics to the developing world. We have no outside investors who have to be paid, no uh, VC returns, no royalties, no stockholders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yuna, for that really fascinating and wonderful, uh, wonderful insight into into a, a model of development uh, that works. I really appreciate that. I hope people have read her bio, and you'll note that she has all sorts of awards and all sorts of wonderful uh, achievements, including an OBE from the Queen, the Order of the British Empire. Does that get you an invitation to the royal wedding? You should be on your knees. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will be. I will be. <laughs> <laughs> but but for us, even more important, she is also a research professor here at the at the Boston University um, uh, School of Medicine, uh, and serves on the board of visitors of the BU School of Medicine. So thank you very much for that. Our second speaker uh, also comes from the world of practice and brings a lot of experience in in development in a number of institutions. He comes from Root Capital, um, which works on sustainable development, and you'll hear all about the wonderful work they do. Uh, he directs. Uh, directs the business strategy of uh, Root Capital, and before that, he's also worked for um, Oxfam and was the director of their sustainable coffee uh, program. Uh, Liam Brody. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Yay, food coma. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about food, so perfect. Um, so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having Root Capital. It's a real honor. Uh, my guess is many of you are, are looking, saying, you know, what the heck is this baby-faced guy doing up here on such a distinguished panel? Uh, note, m my wife has told me that I can no longer use the term baby-faced, that it's really a junk food addiction to describe what I have now. Uh, I've spent the last 15 years working to build sustainable natural products, particularly food products, and, and the markets around the world. Uh, building markets for fair trade coffee, for orga organic quinoa, for shea butter. Not a lot of junk food there, but the tide has changed. How many of you have heard of, tasted, or gorged yourself on jalapeno poppers? Come on, be honest. <laughs> All right, some of you have homework to do, clearly. What the heck do jalapeno poppers, these are things that have a chunk of jalapeno, stuffed cheese in the middle, it's fried once, then they're breaded and fried again. What does that have to do with development that works? <laughs> I wish I got here in time for lunch, I'm hungry. <laughs> I, uh, I'm just back from the central highlands of, of Peru, up in the Andes. Uh, I was visiting one of our, our amazing clients at Root Capital, uh, way up somewhere around 11,000 to 14,000 feet. And let me step back for a minute and tell you just a, a bit about Root Capital. Root Capital is uh, it's a social investment fund. We've been around for about 10 years. We were founded in uh, the greater Boston area, across the river in Cambridge by my boss, Willie Foote, who was on his way to Harvard Business School and uh, decided in kind of during orientation that he had an existential crisis and dropped out uh, to, to try something different. Root Capital provides capital, 
loans in our case, and training to small grassroots businesses, mostly rural, in Latin America and Africa. So think of the co-op of Rwandan farmers that sells to Starbucks. I see a lot of Starbucks cups on, you know, around the room. Think of, you know, some of the, the tastiest high fine chocolate that you've had uh, that's organic. Those are the kind of clients that, that Root finances. Over the last 10 years, we've, we've provided um, about $300 million in financing to, to over 300 businesses in Latin America and in Africa. A lot of growth in the last few years. The first five years was really about proof of concept. Last year alone, we did $80 million in disbursements to, to about just under 200 uh, small and grassroots businesses around the world. This year, we'll do over $115 million in disbursements to those same businesses, probably hitting about 225 businesses this year. So let me tell you about one of those businesses that I was just uh, visiting in, in the highlands of Peru. It's called Agro Montero. Agro Montero is, is to me a great example of kind of why we're here, talking about development that works. What are we seeing? And, and I come here kind of humbly with my perspective as a practitioner. What am I seeing that, that works? Agro Montero is a private social enterprise so different than many of the co-ops and farmer associations that Root Capital works with around the world. And it's led by an amazing Peruvian entrepreneur named Augusto. This is a company that engages in buying directly from smallholder farmers, engages in long-term relationships. So building relationships o over you know, three to five to 10 years uh, with their suppliers something that many of these smallholders in, in the highlands of, of Peru have never, have never experienced. Something different about uh, Agro Montero is that they provide technical assistance directly to the smallholders. They provide technical assistance to improve quality, to Im improve yields, to improve consistency of product, and they also provide technical assistance on something that's not primarily business driven, but on issues of food security and lowering environmental impact. So a really amazing group. What makes them even more special is that they're in a small town called La Concepcion. La Concepcion is a, is a town of about 3,000 in the highlands. It's one of the biggest towns in the area. It's a tiny little place in a very remote, barren area where not much grows except for jalapenos and artichokes and a little bit of quinoa. So I had the chance to, to go out and in visit some of these farms, but then I got the chance to, to go and see the operation. Agro Montero is an amazing example of a state-of-the-art food processing facility up in the highlands. This food processing facility has contracts with some of the, the most uh, you know, influential food companies in the world. At that food processing uh, facility, they hire about 500 people. Most of these folks are indigenous women who, for the first time in their life, have formal employment. I had the chance to, to go, I, I don't know uh, that, that I can compare to your, your, um, your, your um, experience with the queen, but we were given basically what was the, the local version from the local mayor of being knighted. And uh, because he said that this business is central to the future you, you do, you do. I, we can do that later when nobody's watching. I wouldn't want to embarrass you. Uh, it, it was always one of those funny things, you know, you're in certain communities and the, the ceremony where we are given this, this beautiful award at the end, uh, they, they, instead of playing kind of some of the rich, beautiful indigenous music of the area, they played Brian Adams' Everything I Do, I Do For You, which <laughs> <laughs> makes you realize how flat and funny the world is. So this, this amazing facility, Agro Montero, has contracts with General Mills and McCain. General Mills is, is known you know, to you for everything from Cinnamon Toast Crunch to owning brands like the Jolly Green Giant. In that amazing factory, in that processing facility, they take artichokes from the Central Highlands, they can them and they jar them and they clean them and they export them to Europe and the US where if you go around here on a regular supermarket shelf, you don't realize, but you're contributing to sustainability, you're contributing to development. 
It's not 10 years ago when I was actually around 10 years ago in the same room working with a group of students talking about building the fair trade market in the U.S. where you had to ask for something special, where you knew that that product had one specific impact. This is different. Business is changing in really exciting ways. One of the other products that, that they offer and one of the other contracts that they have is with this group called McCain, who is the world's leading manufacturer of jalapeno poppers. So for the first time in my you know, development and sustainability career, I can be proud now that when you go to a Friday's or an Applebee's or some pizza joint around the corner, you're likely participating in development in ways you never knew you could by eating junk food, <laughs> a jalapeno popper, because that jalapeno popper most likely came from the Central Highlands of Peru from a small holder that you're impacting. What's our role? A couple of years ago, they came to us because they said, this, this entrepreneur who had been at business for a long time said, all my friends in banking are laughing at me, saying, why would you pay these prices to these people? And he said, because I'm doing business different and because I have contracts behind me. They said, well, you're not bankable in my book. He said, listen, I can pay the interest rates. They said, no, 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 no. It's not about that. Uh, we'll give it to you, but we'll, we'll give it to you on different terms. There were terms that he just couldn't live by. The business couldn't live by. The business couldn't survive. They couldn't provide the liquidity they needed in order to buy the product from the farmers and pay them the price they wanted to. So the linchpin for this business, it ain't sexy, the linchpin was simple, straight vanilla debt, a loan, a small business loan. There's no small business association uh, to serve the needs of businesses like this in Peru, nor most other countries that we work in around the world. He came to us. We provided a $500,000 loan as a first loan, and the business continued to grow. We went from $500,000 last year to $600,000 this year, and the business has doubled in size and, and reached profitability. It's an amazing story, and at, at root, I've had the chance to see businesses like this around the world, whether it was in my days at Oxfam working on cooperative development or my days in the private sector working at Green Mountain on, on value chains and sustainability. Most of our focus at Root is on small and growing businesses that are trapped in what we call, and many people have heard these days, the missing middle. It's that space where people say you're too big for, for a microfinance loan or you're too small or too rural or too remote for commercial banks. Our simple innovation at Root Capital is to provide financing that meets our clients' needs. That's one of our sweet spots. We're not uh, attempting to distort the market with preferential rates. We're trying to meet our clients' needs to provide them the financing they need when they need it and using things like contracts from a Starbucks or a General Mills as collateral when many smallholders don't have recognizable collateral from banks. The finance that we provide at Recapital, like I said, is one of those linchpins. It, it allows um, Agra Montero, the smallholder farmers that they buy from, to participate in the global economy and to generate jobs that wouldn't otherwise exist. That's bringing about dynamic change, and the thing I love about it is it's change with dignity. What we've learned from doing this work are that there are two really important forces looking at, at development that we should really pay attention to more, which I'm glad to see you're getting more attention these days. Uh, and Professor Juma will talk about one of those in depth. Small businesses need to be paid attention to. They are amazing force for change. Here at home in the US, small businesses account for 64% of jobs created over the last 15 years. Small businesses today in the US account for more than 50% of those employed in the private sector. We need to focus more attention on small business in the developing world. Agriculture. For years, agriculture has been underinvested around the world. It just wasn't sexy and fun anymore. Uh, and we can go into the politics and uh, past uh, some other time. But uh, as the World Bank reminds us, investments in agriculture have two times the impact are twice as effective at ameliorating poverty than any other investment. At Root, we've learned to break down boundaries, the old kind of, uh, you know, orthodoxies that private was bad and public was good. 
we realize that it takes an ecosystem. We have to work together uh, on an, an approach. We have to, to be collaborative. And in some ways, my boss always says, pathologically collaborative. We have to be collaborative to create the shared value that can crush grinding poverty, conflict, and, and injustice. Let me shift for a second, moving across the ocean from, from my friends in Peru to uh, a, a small country in West Africa. Uh, how many of you are familiar with, with Liberia? Liberia has an amazing story, a rich history, and in some ways uh, a super tragic history that's having a, a you know, renaissance right now. I uh, was in Liberia last year for a little bit. It's one of my favorite places in the world. I've um, you know, adopted family from Liberia. And I had the chance to, to go visit Liberia because one of our clients is, is there in Monrovia. Agriculturally oriented business with kind of backwards and forwards linkages to, to agriculture, but in this case, something different. I don't, has anybody seen the, the movie Pray the Devil Back to Hell? If you haven't seen it, write it down. It's a special movie that talks about bringing an end to conflict and violence in a different way. It highlights women who brought an end to the conflict in Liberia uh, by, by peaceful, nonviolent protest. In many ways, echoes some of what we've seen around the world in recent weeks and months. The women uh, you know, thought that their first you know, huge mammoth goal of a lifetime was to bring end to conflict. Their second, elect the first female head of state in Africa. Their third, economic justice. So they created, and the women that are in this video, created something called the Liberian Women's Sewing Project. Maybe not the best branded name for a business, but something different. They, they developed this business with an entrepreneur who was an American repat, so a, a Liberian that grew up in the States and came home named Chid Liberty, and they decided not on a cooperative model to create a garment manufacturing facility in Monrovia, but a business model where the women who were engaged in the business, all the women, had equity. 25% of profit would be plowed into equity for the women, so they own the business, and the other 75% into Amazing things like social programs that provide post-traumatic stress counseling because over half the women in Liberia have suffered sexual violence and because over, I think, 80% of the folks in Liberia have no formal employment, small business generation besides that. Now they're working with some of the greatest um, garment manufacturers and clothing companies around the world to provide t-shirts that are made in Liberia and buying West African cotton from West African smallholder cotton farmers. For me, that's what Root Capital is all about. It's making these things work. It's being part of that community and helping enable these things. Uh, for me, what works is that collaboration. It's realizing that we have to break down old boundaries and that we're part of ecosystems. We have to look at new models, not being uh, afraid of private enterprise when it's focused on social environmental ends, focusing deeply on agriculture and small business. And like I said earlier, I know it ain't sexy, but simple interventions like loans can change the world. I see it, I know it, we track it, we're data rich, the impact is there, and now I'm seeing the world change because big companies are coming in where only progressive players once stood. Thanks so much. Thank you, Liam. Uh, and, and thank you especially for giving me a reason and maybe an excuse to have more jalapeno poppers. Uh, <laughs> that's how I got to look like this. Uh, <laughs> our third speaker is Kabir Kumar. Kabir comes to us from the consultative group to assist the poor, and he works in the third. So we've had health, we've had agriculture and, and, and finance, and now we'll hear about um, information technology and finance. Uh, he works uh, to build partnerships on the use of cell phones and other technologies to expand uh, the poor's access to finance. Kabir. Thanks, Adil. I, I actually feel out of place on this panel for, for two reasons. One is I can't even claim 15 years, uh, Liam. Uh, and the other reason is that CGAP, the organization I, I work for, is, you know, I wouldn't really call it a practitioner. It's, and, and frankly, I don't know what to call it. But let me, let me explain what it is. Those of you who were here uh, in the morning, Amar Bhattacharya talked about you know, a thousand trust funds at the World Bank as an example of, of multilateralism. <laughs> well, CGAP is one of them. And, and we are funded by the World Bank, but we are also funded by 30 other, other donors. 
And, and you know, just as an example of you know, the role of philanthropic capital, the program I work for, which is the CGAP uh, technology program, is uh, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Surprise, surprise. And, and also funded by, by, uh, by DFID, by the UK aid agency. And you know, our program, so CGAP broadly is about financial access for low-income people. And we work actually at different levels in, in, of the market, so to speak. So we work with central banks, uh, and we work with the policy establishment directly, but we also work with practitioners on the ground. And, and we also do research uh, to understand and explain the direction of the industry. And, and we sometimes get involved in the operational weeds of things. And so it's sort of this you know, organization that works at all aspects of what is broadly financial access for low-income people. And the CGAP technology program is specifically about new ways of delivering financial services. And in particular, for the last uh, five years, we've been involved with mobile financial services. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Um, um, in fact, uh, you know, one of the most well-known, uh, I don't know if you guys have been sort of reading The Economist or been in the loop, but mobile financial services has become sort of this thing the last few years, the very, very big thing obviously in financial services for low-income people, but also generally a bigger phenomena in development in general. And, 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 and it's, you know, it's not something we are necessarily celebrating, but it just sort of has happened over the last few years. And one of the reasons it's happened that way is because of, of M-Pesa Kenya. And, and this is, you know, in Kenya there are about 40 million people. And since it's launched, uh, M-Pesa is a mobile money transfer service developed by Safaricom, a mobile network operator in Kenya. And since it's launched in 2007, it has reached 13.1 million people with a mobile wallet account, uh, which is pretty much the entire adult, close to the entire adult population in that country. And this is a country where there, to this day, there are 8 million bank accounts six million of them with one bank in a market with 46 banks in total. And it's gone from processing you know, some, something like 10 million transactions in its initial months to 300 million transactions on average on a monthly basis in recent months. And uh, it, it's in the initial period it was reaching largely more educated, younger people who were more familiar with banking services, but over time Studies have shown that it's actually reaching poorer households, not necessarily the poorest households, but it's reaching poorer households. And, and it's built largely on domestic transfers. So you, get a, you open an account and, and, uh, and you, use, you sort of deposit money in that account and you use it to send money. And you deposit money at 20,000 locations. These are essentially small uh, retail stores. Uh, you know, sort of corner stores, uh, and, and you know, this is again a country where there are roughly 900 bank branches, so there are 20,000 access points covering this entire geography. Th this is part of the reason why you know, mobile financial services become so exciting in financial services in particular, but development in general. Now, at the same time that, that uh, you know, Safaricom was working on M-Pesa, uh, around 2007, we, you know, it's an unfortunate name, Easy Pass, <laughs> but we, we were involved with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Telenor and Tamir Microfinance Bank in Pakistan to launch a similar service. This was just months after M-Pesa launch, we were also involved. And, my, you know, Tamir is a microfinance bank you might doing. Translate Pesa for those who don't. But that, it's, that translates into Easy Money. Easy Money. That's why, that's why I said it's an unfortunate. <laughs> unfortunate name, but apparently, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with mobile network operators, they spend a lot of money on branding and marketing, they're largely marketing companies, and they spend a lot of money figuring out that. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, what we did, we, we were involved early on, we, we kind of brokered the partnership between Telenor, which is also the partner in Grameen Phone that Iqbal Kadir brought up earlier. Um, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, Telenor, sort of the management of Telenor is very focused on, on low-income consumers. It sort of, it talks the talk of wanting to reach low-income consumers. And, and mobile network operators in general are about a service that works for everyone. 
so it's sort of ingrained in their, in their thinking, but Telenor in particular talks the talk, and that's why we thought that partnership worked. And in fact, Telenor owns 51% of Tamir Microfinance Bank, and together they launched a bill payment and domestic transfer service uh, in Pakistan. This is again a country, and they're doing about roughly a million transactions now, and this is a country with, I would say, about five million bank accounts. Um, and, and there's a sort of, having been intimately involved with the service, there's this plan to, you know, bring in credit, savings, and insurance products that are targeted to low-income consumers, again, through a network of close to 4,000 agents, okay? So these are examples of, you know, what's, what's made my, uh, mobile financial services very exciting. But, you know, since this is about sort of taking a step back and looking at what works and what doesn't, because we've been involved, you know, I want to share with you what I think is probably sort of the, the good, but also the bad and the ugly of mobile financial services. And, 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 and what, you know, by sharing that, I'm hoping that you would sort of, we could also use that as lessons for social enterprises in general. Sort of things that are, that when they work, what's good about them, and when they don't work, or when they don't, not, don't work exactly in the way we want them to work, what's bad and what's ugly. Okay? So when it comes to mobile financial services, the first thing is that the, what's good about it is that, you know, as you heard from Iqbal Kader, generally speaking about the growth of mobile phones in low-income countries, in, in 2005, uh, I think mobile phone became the first device that was more prevalent in poor countries, so to speak, than in rich countries. In 2010, of the 4.7 billion cell phones that are out there, two-thirds are in developing countries. And um, this is... Um, Someone we met in ar around 2007 when we were doing research in the Philippines. He's about 18, he was 18 years old then. And what he's done is, in just to give you an, an idea of sort of how important this device is in the lives of people, that's a very simple sort of Nokia 1100, I think. It's a very basic handset. And he burnt off the f face of the handset. So that has all the letters, you know, the buttons with the with the letters and the numbers, he burned that off. And he had taken a, uh, a ballpoint pen, cut it in half, and put a rubber band on one end, and made his own stylus. I don't know, you know, we heard about floppy disks, disks and so on, but have you heard about <laughs> styluses? So the, he created his own stylus, and he was doing roughly 300 text messages a day. Uh, he claimed to have two girlfriends that he was texting with. <laughs> And he had, he had, you know, he, he was someone who took care of two kids of a, of a local family. He kind of ferried them from school and home. He worked in a local store. And so the cell phone was a very, very important part of his life. And he claimed that this was the thing that people were doing at that time, his age group. This is what they did. They took this handset and they burnt off the face and they created the stylus. And it was the thing they did. And around that same time, I don't know whether it was the iPhone or what it was, but there was stories in the US about someone who had hacked into, maybe had cracked the iPhone, the first iPhone. And I was thinking, you know, how young people really customize technology. They sort of take it and they make it their own. And this was another, you know, example in the markets that we were working in. So one of the things that actually is good about mobile financial services is that it was actually, you know, based on need. There was, this was a self, cell phones were really important in the lives of these people. But more importantly than that, People were using cell phones in ways that gave it a very good, you know, good indication that mo possibly financial services would work. For instance, people were using, there were a lot of examples, and at that time they were sort of anecdotal, but now it's been documented extensively, using cell phone airtime credits uh, as a way to transfer money. In Pakistan, people would send airtime to their family, and they would cash that airtime out. And people were paying 20% premium. You know, Western Union is 11, 12%, in some markets 18%, 20% premium to, to do that instant transfer. And, and it, it was not a service that was marketed. Obviously, you know, uh, um, um, mobile network operators were not marketing, you know, the use of airtime for this, but it just sort of evolved over time. Okay, so that's one. That's what's good. The other thing that's good is that it was kind of, you know, fitting a business need, and this is important for social enterprises in general. For mobile network operators, what's been happening over the years is that because of competition, their revenues in the voice business have been declining precipitously. That's the first chart on the left there. And at the same time, churn, which is sort of the percentage of customers they lose every month, has been going up quite significantly. You know, so they were looking for something like financial services that could help stop this. You know, either increase the revenue or 
stop the churn from happening. So that was another good thing. That it, was, it wasn't something that was about you know, just general social good. It actually had uh, a business grounding. It had a business need. The second thing that was good that's happened as a result over time is that it's opened up new vistas, in particular for, for, uh, for M-Pesa in Kenya. So M-Pesa, as I mentioned to you, was domestic transfers. But over time, other services have come up on what a lot of people call the rails of M-Pesa. So you have m which is a savings account linked to M-Pesa. So a lot of people were leaving balances, but they were not earning interest because a mobile network operator is not a bank and cannot give interest. So they could now move it to a bank account and earn interest and then do other things with it. And you know, Musoni is a uh, microfinance. It's a microcredit to lender that's entirely on the M-Pesa platform. So the, you know, they're trying to be as, as cashless as possible. In fact, there are a lot of MFIs that are now doing 75% to 80% of their loan repayments in Kenya using the M-Pesa platform. So it sort of opened up new vistas, and they're doing that because it's cheaper. They're doing that because it's more convenient for their, for their, for their consumers, for their borrowers. So that's, that's what's good. You know? So it filled the need both on the consumer side and the business side, and then it, over time it's opened up these vistas that's been, you know, no, no one would have predicted these services coming on the M-Pesa platform. Now, now what's bad? Well, one of the things that we learned over time, and, and CGAP actually was very, you know, it's something we, we latched on to simply because I think it was very obvious, was that all the services were very much focused, the, sort of the language around mobile financial services around that time was about how, we're going, how technology is going to solve the problem of cash. You know, we're going to, it's going to be cashless societies. We're going to, that's the future that this is part of. You know, we're on that trajectory. But in reality, you know, that future is way off. And we're really dealing in cash economies. And so the, the sort of overemphasis on technology was hurting a lot of the initial services. And in mobile financial services, how does that play out? That plays out, you know, I mentioned M-Pesa has 20,000 agents. I mentioned Easy Pesa has 4,000 agents. That's, those are individual corner stores who actually convert that cash into electronic value and back. And they get paid for it. They get paid a commission. So wh why did I put this in the sort of bad category is that initially a lot of the businesses missed that. They were focused overly on the technology and not on this channel, which was so important. And now, now if you talk to all of them, that's all they talk about. Because they realize that without that, they, this business won't work. And the other reason I put it in the bad category is that it's, it's these channels, these individuals, these corner stores are still sort of malnourished in the whole business. They're still not paid enough commissions. And there's a lot of churn in this channel. They leave. And it can be a great source of income for them. And, and in places where it's worked, we've found that it has been a good source of income for them. So that's one thing that's been bad. The other thing that's, that's in the bad category is that the reason why Safaricom was able to do this in Kenya was that the regulator I think we have better words to describe what it is now. <laughs> but at that time, we used to say the regulator was inert. So what that meant is that the, the regulator was really not, you know, it wasn't that it was intentionally promoting innovation, but it really didn't have a response or an answer to what Safaricom was doing and didn't stop it. Okay, now over time, we've kind of graduated that inert thinking to sort of the test and see approach is what we call it. We, say, we tell regulators, you know, you need to create the enabling environment. And so why do I put this in the bad category is because you don't want a Kenyan regulator. You know, you don't want a regulator that at that time at least was inert. And neither do you want an Indian regulator, which until last fall pretty much crippled any business that's, that came out in the mobile financial services space. It made it very difficult through a sort of series of regulation that, that over time made it very hard. But then last fall they opened it up. And so, you know, what's important is you want a regulator that is sort of taking a test and see approach that's creating the environment. And, and you, you, you don't want someone that's sleeping at the wheel, but someone who's educated, but creating the space for innovation to happen, for social enterprise to take, take hold. And the third thing that's in the sort of bad category is that um, you know, there was a lot of investment that went into my time's over. But I'm going to go fast and finish the last few points, if you don't mind. So you know, this is an important point, and it ties to what, what Liam was talking about. And, what Una brought up as well is that, you know, originally um, uh, Safaricom got, uh, a, a, I think, a million pounds from DFID to go out and test this and trial this. In fact, it was supposed to be a loan repayment service for an MFI. 
Okay? And then as I mentioned, they observed that people were using it to send money home and then it graduated into this money transfer service. But after that, Safaricom itself made investments. Our simple estimate is that it's at least $15 million. It could be the $30, $40 million. So this was an investment that was made without a clear sense of what the business would be down the road. And in mobile financial services in general, uh, and I think social center, uh, enterprises, broadly speaking, there's a need for this early stage financing. And one of the needs that we've identified after we review the space is early stage financing that's at small dollar value. So you have grant funding and then you have commercial financing. But as people graduate from grant funding, there's sort of a bloodbath. And, and you know, because there's nothing in the middle that's still, uh, you know, sort of angel-like, but with a commercial orientation. And then that there was a champion. This is Michael Joseph, who's the CEO of, of, of Safaricom. And he, when you talk to him, you'll say that he sold the business internally to the board, but never knew what the business case was. He, now he, he's retired, so he says that. But at that time, he was pretty much a very strong. So you know, despite all the money from DFID and the fact that these investments were being made, you still needed someone at the high level that was really aggressively, be just aggressively believed in the business. And you just sort of believed that it would make a difference. And even now, you know, part of the conversation we have with him is about the business case. And he gets really annoyed because he, he sort of says that, you know, we shouldn't be talking about the business case because I'll distract from sort of what potential this has. So he, he was really motivated in that sense. Okay, now in terms of ugly, there are basically three things that I want to highlight. First is that, you know, and we can get to it in the Q&A as well, is that there's been, as we move forward, mobile network operators, as I mentioned, you know, they could have all these other benefits. They're, you know, the churn reduction, for instance. Despite all of those benefits and documented evidence that that benefit can be sizable, a lot of these services are still narrowly focused on sort of short-term profitability. And, and the, the point here I want to make is that there is, there is a business case when you come to these services, it's not whether there isn't or there is a business case. There is, but it's a long-term business case. And, and I think that's part of, you know, you need sort of that patience uh, in social enterprises in general. And the last point is that, that there is this obsession with, with sort of replicating M-Pesa now, right? And so someone earlier mentioned that sustainability is sort of this abused word in, in development circles. I would say replication is, a, is an abused word in, in, in development circles and a very bad word when it comes to social enterprises, I think, in general. And, and, and part of the, the, the key thing here is that, you know, why did M-Pesa work in Kenya? There are a lot of factors. One of the factors is that Safaricom is a monopoly in Kenya. And it is an extraordinary market for mobile network operators. And those things add up when you introduce new services as a mobile network operator. So I think a lot of people look at what's worked there and want to replicate it in another market, but there are a lot of things that come together in that particular context. Okay, thank you. Very thank much. you, thank you very much, Kavi. Thank you very much. And no, you, you, you're not out of place. As we had mentioned in the morning, we have purposely made both uh, amongst the uh, panels and within the panels, this this diversity. Our, our last speaker of the panel before we open up is a dear friend and one of the smartest people I know, Kalestis Juma, who comes to us from the Harvard Kennedy School, but we won't hold that against him. Uh, he, he really is a scholar practitioner in the true sense of the word, a former executive director of the uh, United Nations uh, Convention on Biodiversity, the founder of the African Center uh, for uh, Technology in, in Kenya, uh, and, and really one of the most passionate people uh, in terms of making development work and thinking about it, and we will see his passion right now. Thank you. Actually, the, the reason I came is not because of you. I wanted to <laughs> find out uh, what Adil was working on, and I actually did find out his two publications, one is on narcotics, <laughs> and the other is in, on coffee. So the only redeeming feature is that it, chronologically he worked on narcotics first and then coffee <laughs> <laughs> later. So he's, uh, he's, this, is a, this is a big improvement. Uh, but the, the one that caught my attention was uh, Africa 2060, uh, good, news, good news from Africa. I know you have an obligation to work on longer term uh, trends, but I, what I just wanted to deliver to you uh, this afternoon is uh, essentially good news that is happening now. Uh, so we don't have to wait until, until 2060 and uh, 
what we've done is basically documented that in a in a publication in a book that just came out. I've circulated a, a summary of it, and actually, what I normally do is I circulate this summary, and I go straight into Q and A, so so I don't have to actually talk about the book. <laughs> Uh, so so it's, I share the abstract for it. And essentially what we, we make a, a, a claim in that book that uh, uh, Africa can feed, it, can feed itself in a generation. And this is really based very much on uh, observations on the ground looking at uh, what's happening among African countries and really uh, in the context of a kind of a long history of uh, pessimistic views about the continent uh, we started finding out countries that were able to reverse uh, famine in a couple of years, uh, countries that had been starving for 20 years that had basically uh, were being treated as laboratories for studying malnutrition, and they turn around in a couple of years. Uh, when uh, Rwanda, after Rwanda went through uh, the horrible uh, genocide, the first thing they did was to basically re rebuild their agriculture, and they were able to do that extremely fast. Uh, and generally, we have not been uh, making an effort to aggregate some of these developments and say, uh, what are the implications for, uh, for the future of the continent? So what the book does is basically it's a compilation of, uh, if you like, stories across the continent uh, that have led us to the view that the continent can, in fact, feed itself uh, in a generation uh, I don't look at, we've been looking at Ethiopia, for example. Ethiopia has been consistently growing at roughly 7 to 8% annually for a decade. Uh, a large part of that growth is, in fact, accounted for by uh, improvements in agriculture. Uh, Nigeria is the fourth fastest growing economy in the world today. Uh, most people's image of Nigeria is a, a corrupt regime that has no hope in hell. Uh, it's totally turning around at the moment, uh, and th this kind of aggregate impacts of changes on the continent basically tell a positive story that, in fact, the, the vision that uh, Adele has in this book of 20, 2060, this is going to be realized in a, in a, in a, very, sh in a very short period. Uh, of course, just a caveat, this is a very big continent. Uh, as, as you can see, you can uh, fit the United States in there, uh, China, Western Europe, India, Argentina, and have sufficient room to sneak in England. So it's <laughs> really huge. Uh, so, so just to leave you with a caveat that when I'm going to use the term Africa, but I'm conscious of the fact that this is uh, three times the size, uh, the size of the, the United States. Uh, so most of my work has really been focusing on a, a very interesting development of the continent, which is the emergence of regional integration bodies. Uh, basically, a new constitutional order for coordinating economic activities across the continent. Very few people are actually observing what's happening in these bodies. There are about eight, uh, eight of them that are functional. Of those, five are probably the most active, the East African community, the West African uh, uh, community, the Eastern and Southern African, which is basically the blue one, which goes all the way to uh, Egypt and Libya. Uh, and uh, these bodies were created as treaties with no escape clauses. So every time they agree to do something, they actually go and do it. Unlike what happens in the, un in the European Union, where every sovereign state has the option to basically not to implement anything. Uh, they work on the basis of roadmaps. Uh, and a large part of the investment and commitments I've been making in the last decade or so have been in infrastructure, which is a critical element of economic transformation. And uh, these are the foundations that are starting to make it possible to think about social enterprises, functioning social enterprises on the, on the continent. You can't really have any kind of enterprise, whether it's social or not if you cannot move goods and services. And so a large part of the decision making that's taking place through these regional bodies uh, is really about laying the foundations for long-term economic transformation. And I'll give some examples of, some examples of that. 
uh, in the area of agriculture, what we've been looking at, it's really interesting the, the view that is emerging among African leaders, which is the recognition that agriculture and the economy are one and the same. Uh, and so the investments they are making in agriculture, they are not making them purely for the sake of prom stimulating agricultural production, but also laying the foundation for other forms of in, uh, innovation. Uh, for example, if you have functioning roads or a functioning uh, water supply systems, you would develop those initially for agriculture, but it's the same infrastructure you need for health, for education, and other activities. And that's why uh, these leaders are starting to focus very much on, uh, uh, on agriculture as the entry point, but they're looking at it in terms of kind of long-term transformation of the, of the economic systems. I've been looking mostly at the, the role of, of innovation, the role of science and technology particularly, uh, in the context of uh, the advantages that late comers have uh, in that uh, technical knowledge expands uh, essentially ex exponentially. Uh, it's estimated today that technical knowledge, if you take scientific publications and patents and other implicit indicators, is doubling every 12 months. Uh, that means uh, all of us have a much larger pool of knowledge at our disposal than our predecessors had. That's essentially what explains why late come economies tend to grow faster than, than their predecessors. And we've seen it with China growing faster than Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia grew faster than Japan. Japan grew faster than, than Western Europe. It's just a very simple mathematical equation, a biological equation, in fact, that ex explains this uh, exponential growth. And this was uh, very difficult to explain to people uh, because we tend to think in a linear, linear terms. But what has changed the perception of African leaders is the existence of a metaphor, which is the mobile phone. Uh, because they have seen the impact of the mobile phone and how rapidly mobile, phones, mobile phone adoption has grown, but also the impact of mobile phones on other economies, as has already been explained, other economic activities, as has been ex explained later on. And uh, in 2007, I was helping African presidents to pull together a summit on science and technology. And it's really interesting uh, having private conversations with them. And uh, they would ask me, that what is the equivalent of the mobile phone in energy, in transportation, in agriculture? So they're looking at it not as a technology, but as a, basically a framework for thinking about the rapid introduction of new technologies, including the leapfrogging impact of moving from landlines to new, uh, to new technological systems. And that's really uh, what is become, it's become really inspirational that you can get serious conversations about the long, long term implications of innovation today uh, with African leaders in ways you couldn't do a decade ago because there is an example that they can look to just the power, the inspirational power of a single technology, which is the mobile phones. Uh, it's been uh, phenomenal in shaping public policy and getting people to be a lot more positive about uh, technology. Before that, whenever you mentioned the technology, the idea of technology, the Im immediate th thought of guns, uh, uh, tractors, all the technologies that had been used to either enslave them or extract raw materials from Africa. The immediate reaction was always a negative one. Uh, so you ha if you, pro you say they were, you offered technology as an option for technological transformation, the owners also knew to explain that this technology was not going to have a negative impact uh, on them. Uh, and it's very difficult to prove a negative. So usually conversations just didn't go very far. But with the mobile phone, you have a, a very different view, which is a positive outlook on the role of inno innovation, and that has opened up the minds of leaders to really start to seek the connections between technology, business, higher technical training, and the long-term economic transformation. So, so uh, this is, let me just uh, get, give a couple of examples, and then I, then I, will, cl I will close. This is, a, this is the map of Africa, uh, I would say, five years ago, and if you look at the east coast of Africa, there was no fiber optic connection. The only optic con connection that existed was on the west coast of Africa with a very traditional business model, which is basically people who could pay a lot of money 
uh, could have access to it uh, had something like 5% 5 5 capacity utilization. So it's, uh, for all practical purposes, had zero impact on the, on the African economy. This is, this is five years ago. This is what Africa looks like today. This is a roughly a $6 billion investment in fiber optic connectivity. Uh, most of these cables either function or are under construction. This has happened just in the last five years. And the only, the only reason this has been possible is this dramatic drop in the cost of laying fiber optic cables. It costs now uh, one-tenth what it, was, it cost about a decade ago. Uh, and this, ex this uh, basically uh, is leading the, le the African leaders to start thinking differently about what's really possible, uh, especially in, uh, in terms of rural transformation. The same, the same thing is happening in the area of uh, investment in transportation technologies, uh, greater connectivity in uh, energy uh, supply in the region. So you see, read the foundations of economic development that you need to think about social enterprises are, are being laid and being done, being done very fast. Uh, so I don't have, if you look at the red one, the red, the red cable from on the west coast of Africa, that's a CECOM laid by a company actually based in New York. Uh, that connects South Africa to Europe. Uh, the timetable for that was defined essentially by the World Cup. Uh, FIFA set the standards that if they didn't have that connectivity, South Africa wouldn't have, uh, 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 the, wouldn't host the World Cup. That's a $650 million investment of which 75% came from uh, African shareholders. And that's what triggered the, the rest of the investments. Uh, and I've, I've been saying that uh, because of that little example, in fact, FIFA has done more for African infrastructure than all the development banks uh, put together by simply setting, uh, set, setting the standards. Uh, this is what's happening now inter internally within African countries, terrestrial wiring. This is a $400, $400 hundred million dollar investment by Tanzania to connect within uh, within Tanzania itself, with a target on sectors like agriculture, health, uh, and education. Uh, similarly, this is Rwanda, which has been a leader in thinking about innovation and, uh, uh, and particularly information and communications technologies. Uh, these are, uh, in, in my view, they're going to have a very significant impact on the possibility to do new things on the continent. In fact, the few examples we've had today uh, these are just really good indicators of what is uh, what's going to happen in the future. I, I wanted to close by uh, basically making reference to the, the the role of executive leadership uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the really interesting developments on the part of African presidents starting to think seriously about, uh, about innovation. And I, I, I actually don't, you usually show them this slide and, and let them know. Uh, it's the only slide I show African presidents that the role of an African president is not to look pretty, uh, but actually to participate a bit more actively in coordinating some of these activities. If you take agriculture, for example, uh, it's really about roads, uh, private sector activities, about higher technical training, and only the president has the political capital to make this uh, co coordination. Uh, without that investment, actually very little happens. And some of the interesting ideas we've been uh, hearing today, they don't scale up if you don't have that high level, uh, high level leadership. I heard about the INAT, INAT uh, uh, regulator. Uh, we are thinking of a, a sl slightly different view, which is an entrepreneurial uh, state in a way. and, and this is a, a kind of a very hopeful message uh, for, the, for the continent. Uh, I, right now, very interested in just hearing more about uh, what kinds of emerging technologies could be uh, used to basically take advantage of this, this, this new development. So thank you again for the opportunity to be here and to participate on this, uh, this panel. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. We, we've had four extremely interesting, innovative uh, conversations, and I want to open it up. Uh, in some ways, all of them have celebrated the possibility. Uh, in many ways, all of them have celebrated the role of technology in development. Uh, and what I, we want to do uh, once again is maybe open up, take a few questions, come back to, to our panelists. Uh, we had a presentation to begin with on health and, and the type of innovation that can happen uh, through these devices, which look like postage stamps. I just wanted to remind people because we have had four uh, sort of uh, interesting presentations. So we started off with health. Uh, we went to the role of finance, of loans, uh, with the story of root capital. We talked with Kabir Kumar. Uh, in terms of telecommunication, and a lot of uh, that has been talked about this morning, including by Dilip Mukherjee in his question, and we want to probably come to that. You know, is this really, are we celebrating business or are we celebrating development or are we celebrating the link? And, and hopefully we'll come to those questions we had in the morning. And finally, we had a, a presentation on, on, on the role of innovation. So questions, comments, ideas? Eileen? If we can take a bunch of quick ones so that we can get in more. Uh. Hi, my name is Elaine Ting from the Party Center. I have a question for Liam. So recently on the New York Times, I read an article about how indigenous food like quinoa is getting very hot in the developed world, and this has caused big businesses to go into indigenous, in indigenous communities and raise the cost of food, despite, you know, like, small businesses profiteering. Um, the indigenous people are buying junk food instead of quinoa because it's more expensive now and then we have malnutrition happening. So my question is, how do you balance economic development with social development like health? Okay. okay. How do you balance economic development with social development? Tim Weiss there uh, at the back. If other people can raise their hands so that I can recognize them and get the mic. Um, I was just wondering if uh, Kalatsis Juma could take take us one step further from from his presentation to uh, to the harvest, that is to the agricultural implications of all the innovation that um, that you're talking about in the um, in your presentation. Yeah. We'll have a question there, and then John Harris, and then we'll come back to the group. Uh, runs. Uh, my question is that, uh, following the question this morning, is that what will be the role of government to really help those uh, private sector initiatives to in the develop to help the developing country? Okay. John Harris, and then we'll come back to the group, and I might add one question. It's probably to uh, to uh, Calistos. Uh, at least historically in Africa, where you have sparsely populated. Semi-arid areas has been very difficult to get any kind of, uh, of development, agriculture, or, or other. And clearly, you're showing these changes now in communication and technology. What kind of changes in clustering of population is going to happen, and is there any hope for these uh, relatively sparsely populated semi-arid areas? Great. We've had a bunch of quick questions. If I can add one for both Kabir and Yuna in some ways, different presentations, but 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 similar question. When, if I hear your story of M-Pesa and your story of Diagnostics for All, the difference seems to be that in one case, Diagnostics for All, the idea seems to be we want to do development. We want to get these diagnostics to the poorest people. And that's why we create a non-profit. The business model seems to be that primarily and we'll use the business side to fund that. When we, when I hear the story of M-Pesa and so on and so forth, it seems that there's a business that just wants to do business and you know do what business does, which is perfectly fine. And by happenstance, it may or may not get the social benefits. Should we as development people be looking at these stories differently? And do you think it matters to the business end which place the story starts from? So anyone and everyone on any of those issues? Kalestis, can we start with you and go down the? You had a bunch of questions. I have to restrain myself, uh, Tim. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the, the, the long-term implications of mobile communication for agriculture. The one thing that has happened with African agriculture was the collapse of uh, of extension services. 
extension officers are basically they do one thing they move info they move technical information from research institutes to the farmers that's what they really do and then they bring back questions actually with mobile phones you don't need a land rover to do that uh, and so uh, one can start to see and it's being designed systems are being designed in Rwanda now uh, where mobile communication becomes a substitute for the land rover because uh, that's what it does it's basically moving information embodied in the head of uh, an extension officer. Uh, with mobile communication, you don't need that. Now, the reason why these fiber optic cables uh, are important is that uh, you can now start to move large quantities of data in that a farmer can take a picture of a plant uh, and put it on the internet. And some agronomist anywhere in the world can actually name what that disease of the affecting that plant is. Uh, and uh, Ethiopia has just set up an agricultural transformation agency. Uh, and one of the functions is, in fact, to bring this mobile communication to, to bear on agriculture. Um, similarly, we've seen the really dramatic uh, expansion of the adoption of transgenic crops in, uh, in Burkina Faso. Uh, and the area of agricultural biotechnology, this again, techniques that were not available to India when India was doing the Green Revolution. Um, and other areas that we are looking at is uh, the, the changes in clean energy technologies, particularly in solar energy, uh, that makes it possible to generate energy for decentralized communities. Uh, so, so most of the impact of these emerging technologies, in fact, is going to be, uh, to be on agriculture. I can go through a long list. But the fundamental question really here is the infrastructure part, particularly uh, tra transportation, energy, telecoms is being taken care of, and irrigation. Those are the areas that I, I think are going to have a huge impact on, uh, on African agriculture. In a, in a, I think, John, your question is an interesting one, because Africa is the fastest urbanizing continent uh, on, uh, in the world today. And I think that that question is going to be answered in the context of what happens in urban areas. Most of Africa's capitals account for 50 to 60 percent of the GDP of the countries. And so in places like Nigeria, getting Lagos to work as a, as a really a business center has huge implications on what happens in the rural areas. And so I think we are going to see an Africa that is where urban areas are a lot better organized. I think the story of Lagos is, a, is an interesting one where it's been cleaned up largely only in a few years because you had a real inspirational leader become a governor there. Uh, and the creation of new businesses, I'm working with colleagues in Nigeria right now on uh, building a new industries around uh, electronic books, uh, businesses that never existed in the past. Uh, they are now looking at, into really creating a modern industry around Nollywood, basically moving into animation and other areas of, uh, of, uh, of both, both entertainment and, and communications technology. So I think, I think the continent is going to look uh, very, very different in a very short period. Mm -hmm. Kabir? You know, as I mentioned, um, you know, you take Kenya, for instance, there is a huge gap in access to financial services. So, you know, from a from a development perspective, the the question that was in our minds is, you know, you know, how can we fill that gap? How can we get financial services to people? So, you know, arguably, even though there is a business motivation, and as I mentioned, frankly, I don't see that as necessarily being a wrong thing. Sure. I think it's a good sure. thing. Uh, it was actually filling a need you know, filling a gap that the banking sector in Kenya, for instance, or the banking sector in, in Pakistan, even even the microfinance sector in Pakistan, for that matter, hadn't been able to. So by getting sort of a basic service out there at, at a price point that was attractive for both the provider and the, and the consumer, uh, it, was, it was sort of achieving both things. The, the question is, you know, what kind of development impact? So for instance, the you know, obviously, as I mentioned, the M-Pesa service, you know, appealed first to those who were slightly better off among those that needed that service. So over time, it's, you know, made its way to, I think, it's now 79% of households. 
So, um, you know, if we went in with the view that it was going to make a difference in the poorest households, I think we would have been mistaken. And, or, or Safaricom would have been mis mistaken, I should say. And, and we would have been mistaken when it comes to Easy Pesa. Um, I, you know, it's also important that it's not that there aren't cell phones in the hands of those individuals. As I mentioned, it's sort of, and as you were saying, this is, it's, it's everywhere and it's, you know, these, these devices are everywhere. It's the service that we were, so to speak, piping on that channel. This was financial service. So, you know, if we were, you know, if it was not... Not to belabor the point, and maybe this is both also for Liam, uh, then, you know, this, I go back to Dilip's comment this morning, if you were here for that. So when we talk about especially cell phones, the numbers we hear is so many people have cell phones or so many transactions are done over cell phones. Do we know if those cell phones, having a cell phone or having a transaction actually has a development impact? People are more healthy, people are better fed, people are more educated. Or are we simply celebrating that more people have cell phones? Which, which is fine as a business goal, I understand. But, but, but do we know if all of this, as well as what Root is doing, actually changes development profiles in serious ways? Okay. Maybe I'll, I'll sure. take a stab at that. I, I mean, maybe it's, it's, we should ask a different question about development impact, perhaps. You know, obviously, I don't want to draw a line from cell phone use and to education and health. But I could argue that having communications, you know, being able to talk to your family members or being in touch with people. You haven't has, met my family. <laughs> <laughs> has a development impact. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> and you know, I, I, I obviously, you know, I, I was there when when they brought up that those studies, and it would be great to understand what questions were asked, and and you know, and what did how do we end up with this perspective that it has had no impact? Uh, uh, but you know, there is there there have been other studies that have been interesting. There've been there's one that was done that showed you know how people use a service as it reflects how much they might value it. So there, there are studies that show people using cell phones that who are not very literate, where the, you know, the, the, the phone, whether in whatever condition they're using this phone because they've memorized the five numbers they need to call, you know, because that's very important for their business needs. So the, you know, the sort of the extra effort that you put in to make that service actually work for you should say something about the kind of impact it's having in their lives. So I, I, maybe we should, you know, have a different definition definition of development impact, and and maybe we don't have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. I mean, I impacts that question we all wrestle with, and we certainly do at Root Capital. Uh, for for us at Root Capital, we don't think about it as impact. Uh, I think that's far too simplistic. You know, we think about what are our impacts, um, and that makes the the brains of some of our investors and and some of our um, donors just burn. <laughs> because they want it to be simple. They want it to be so simple that it's, I invest a dollar in root capital, it has X impact on poverty or on hunger, and at least in my experience, it's not that simple. One of the things that we're looking at root capital, just as an analogy to try to think about it, uh, is looking at impact from, a, from an analogy of, of a global positioning system or satellite. Thinking about uh, a couple different points of triangulation, not just one survey method, not just one self-reporting method, but a whole host of ways um, to, to generate understanding of the impacts of our work. Uh, so some of those might be working with academic um, ethnographers or anthropologists to really understand the greatest change in a community that, that our, our finance has. Our finance doesn't go directly to a farmer. Our finance goes to a small business, a farmer co-op, and then we're once removed. So this issue of attribution is, is, is a hard one. And sometimes we, I, I feel like we get flemmixed. We get tied up in knots about precision when maybe precision isn't the, the name of the game. Maybe we're trying to have a better general understanding um, because maybe precision requires a, a level of cost that is not worth the level of cost. We definitely need to be aware of these things, and at root we take it very serious. So we, we uh, have kind of one level of impact that we're able to secure when we do due diligence on a client to uh, determine whether or not we're able to provide them with financing. We're able to go and say, okay, what's the social impact of your business? We have a sense of 
how many how many beneficiaries, how many farmers, how many households are are, are um, you know benefiting from this loan? We have a sense of how much revenue is generated by this loan specifically, and how much income is then generated for each farmer from from the business and the loan. We know that. On average, last year, each of our each of our loans generated approximately thirteen hundred dollars in income uh, for uh, you know the the folks that we serve. That's being able to, to to kind of roll down and cascade down, and we're working with different points like um, uh, out of poverty uh, studies, progress out of poverty studies, as one point of triangulation. We have a you know large data set because we're data rich as a financial uh, you know services provider in essence. So we have large data sets that we're now looking to work with academic economists to be able to do regressions and understand what's the impact of our loan, our first loan, on a business's growth over time, and what can we learn about business growth generally on social or or environmental development or impact. So I think it's it's a larger question that we certainly pay deep attention to um, and, and that's very important. And I should say the other part of it, and it comes back in some ways to your question about quinoa, is we don't go in with a preset, you know, fully baked agenda. We serve the needs of businesses that come to us looking to serve their development agenda, looking to serve their business strategy. And we have standards, environmental and social standards, because we believe that finance, that capital markets are, are values neutral. And, but we're not. We're, we're a social investment fund. We have strong values. And you know, we look at the crumbling of, kind of capital markets over the last uh, you know, few years. We don't want to crowd in financial players that crush businesses and the social you know, and environmental and, and development impacts that we've helped create. So we're trying to model best behavior so we crowd in a new type of capital that, that serves the specific needs of businesses at the base of, of the pyramid. Uh, these, are, these are deep, longer mm -hmm. conversations that it's hard to, to give kind of back-of-the-napkin answers, but, but I hope that gives a, a little know? bit. Yes, I think this is a, a much bigger issue that needs a lot of thought. I mean, look, the reason that cell phones have taken off is because they empower individuals, whether it's to do their own banking or whatever. But there is no way that the cell phone itself can have a huge economic impact on health, agriculture, uh, environmental yeah. things such as water, unless we give people the same individual empowerment tools there. And that's what we're trying to do. So if you want to see an impact on health, it's a cell phone is not going to make it any easier to get to an MRI at a hospital. But if you put something totally inexpensive in people's hands so that they can monitor their own glucose, if the farmer can monitor whether his cow is pregnant, has mastitis, it does not then, it doesn't require that milk needs to be carried to market, that you need to pay for a bull you didn't need to pay for. When we talk to the East African Dairy Association, the East African Grain Cooperative, they're not saying to us, we need more roads, we need scaling of our farms. They need to better manage what they've got. And the same is true. I think the cell phone does the walking for you. So if you want to ask a question, you know, I see this color on this strip in my irrigation well, and the answer is don't use it, it contains mercury or it contains lead, you don't have to go to the trouble of, of losing that crop or walking a long distance. So I think what I'm saying is, yes, we've got cell phones that empower certain types of communication. We've got to pe give people the other uh, components for um, empowering them to manage their own health, to manage compliance with behaviors or drugs to manage their crops and their herds locally themselves and get information and advice. And the same with environmental testing. So I think we've moved a long way with cell phones. We've got to catch up the um, other components of a much bigger system. Excellent. As we, as we begin wrapping up, if I can take a minute and maybe ask one question to all four of you. Uh, all four of you are, 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 are obviously both passionate and, and are celebrating the entrepreneurial spirit. 
Uh, we haven't talked as much about government. We will be in the next panel. But what do you see as the role of government in either the developing countries or industrialized countries in whichever way? What is the most important things that governments, you think, need to do to unleash this entrepreneurial capital, if you will, that all of you in some way are really banking on here? And this time, maybe I can start with you and come back and end with Calestis. Well, I think governments can be a huge help or a huge hindrance, and it's partly how they decide, but it's partly how we interact with them. The reason we want local partners is they know the populations best, but they also know the regulatory systems and the distribution systems best. What, what we see is where there are public health systems um, and clinics that governments can be enormously helpful. But they can also use regulatory issues as a weapon. And if you don't work locally, you don't provide jobs, you don't clearly care about the people you're trying to target, they just get in the way, they add cost, they delay. And uh, it's really our job to see that we involve them, I think, so that they're not roadblocks. Mm -hmm. Liam? So the first one, just a caveat that this is Liam's thinking, not Root Capitals. But um, if we look at Western governments and we think about agriculture, one of the first things that they can do is stop the hypocrisy and reform farm subsidies. It, it's a huge development blockade, and it has a greater impact in my mind and, and research shows than you know, you know, foreign assistance, and it's just such hypocrisy. I think if I look from kind of a root capital hat that's certainly linked to that, and, and I should say we don't have a, a policy, public policy or advocacy division within root capital, but we look at what's the enabling environment. Why can't certain countries, why can't banks in certain countries that would love to play in this space use a contract from, from you know, Green Mountain Coffee Roasters as collateral, legitimate collateral, the way that Root Capital can. Changing some of banking regulation to allow for flexibility and for regulation can really help small smallholders and, and communities uh, leap over hurdles. And as someone that grew up in the mainstream ag industry in, in the US and saw the benefit of things like agricultural extension, I would say investing in new schools and new forms of, of ag extension. And one of my colleagues was part of the project and, Rwanda and Uganda that, that Professor Juma mentioned, and also investing in things like a small business administration that serves the needs of small business in, in underdeveloped countries. Great. Kabir, very briefly, what is the role of government in this? I would just uh, echo what Iqbal Qadir said earlier, is that we you know, probably don't want governments involved in the direct provisioning of services. And you know, I could go down the list of standard setting and enabling regulation and in fact even sort of enabling the business by being involved. And there's evidence to suggest that all of that has had positive impact. But when governments are directly involved in the provisioning, it's not always panned out favorably. Kalestas, your friends do not like government much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, think of a, I think of an economy, uh, let me use a, an analogy here. I think of an economy as an orchestra where different entities play different roles or play different instruments. And I've been focusing mostly in my work on uh, what presidents do and encouraging them to think of themselves uh, as the conductors in an orchestra. And I always tell them, I say, look, if you are a conductor in an orchestra, it's going to be really difficult also to be playing the guitar at the same time. And they kind of they get it. So I see really in, in many cases a, a role of orchestration, if you like, a facilitation as opposed to control. But there are certain areas where you may want actually government involved. I'm right now working with the president of Malawi on how to extend infrastructure investments uh, where there's absolutely no funding. And we found out that the only institution in government that could contribute to that is the military. So he's looking into how to leverage the military to build roads. And this is going to be a direct involvement. And you don't want to rule that out uh, because nobody, no private sector is going to go there and build these roads that go to places where you need to invest ahead of demand. Uh, so so I, think, I think when we talk about government, let's use a little bit of sense, just common sense, and not aggregate all aspects of government 
as either good or bad or involved or not involved. <laughs>